Science Editor for Variety. And this is a half hour with the Emmy nominated composers for two of the most successful shows, Succession and Watchmen. And I'm so excited to introduce Nicholas Bristel, who's the composer for Succession. Hi, Nicholas. Hey, Jazz, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Good, good, good. And from Watchmen, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross. Hi. Hello. Hi there. Oh my gosh, well, I'm, first of all, congratulations on the Emmy nominations to all of you. Um, and I'm so excited to be talking to you this afternoon about your the music and how you score and taking us inside your process. Um, but before we start, what I'm going to do is introduce a quick clip from Succession, and then Nick will start to we'll start with the conversation with you first. I'll be providing the documents and can answer any questions you may have in the coming days. Thank you very much. Mr. Wood, do you have anything to say to the victims of these crimes? Did your father know you were making this statement today? Nick, um, the, the music for Succession in season two is so much darker, obviously with Kendall's journey and what we're seeing with the characters. Talk about how you wanted to change the theme from what the music from season one to season two. Yeah, it was, uh, this is the first television series I've ever scored. And uh, I think it was an interesting challenge to think about how do things evolve over the course of these 20 episodes. So season one had its own universe. And then into season two, one of the early conversations that I had with Jesse Armstrong, you know, our, our amazing showrunner, was this kind of question of um, what if we were to think about the whole scope of the show musically as kind of a symphony and thinking of season two as like the second movement of a symphony where, um, you know, perhaps it's a different tone, it's more brooding, it's more inward, darker. Um, like, you know, like you were saying, Kendall begins season two in a really melancholy place. So I, there are definitely new themes for that that we can talk about. But, um, but one of the key questions was, what do we keep? And uh, there, I think the chord progressions and some of these like winding melodies uh, that I had created for season one, um, they became so attached in some ways to the, the Roy family. Um, so we really wanted to keep some of that. And then it was a question of how do those things evolve. So I guess I would say overall, it was a, a combination of a few new themes, you know, for this new journey we're on in season two, but also very specific ways in which some of the themes do kind of take a left turn. Yeah. And how early in, in the process did you get involved with the scoring of season two? I, you know, I, I was lucky that uh, even on season one, I was able to get involved uh, before they had actually even shot the pilot. And uh, in season two, kind of building off of that experience we all had working together, um, I was able to, you know, actually play Jesse some ideas before 
he was shooting stuff and um and i love doing that i actually i'm in my studio here in new york and i invited jesse here pretty early on just to play him some of those ideas there was um this idea for a piece that became rondo in f minor which was that uh the piece which begins around kendall's very sort of melancholic journey uh in season two and there was also um a tonality that you kind of hear in that ending that that final culminating moment in the clip there of season two um there was an exploration i would say of a, of a very baroque kind of a sound actually in season one i had explored um i would say you know part of imagining the sound for the roy family was thinking like what music would they imagine for themselves and it, my answer to that was well maybe it's this kind of like dark courtly classical sound from like the late 1700s. The Baroque sound is almost like a hundred years earlier than that. And it's really almost like the late 1600s actually. And there's this very kind of austere uh, sound, which I think uh, lends perhaps a further gravitas to uh, things like that betrayal that we, that we do see. Yeah. And something else that carries through the season is the theme music. Uh, the title track um, and it just reappears in different iterations throughout the season like talk about that journey and why you know we're still like you can still hear it in your head you know like long after the credits have rolled you know I, I you can never really anticipate how how things uh, you know how things will will turn out um, that that theme and the the sort of variations I've done it does somehow seem very interconnected with these characters in this world. And um, I have a lot of fun with that, actually. I think that's one of the, you know, every project brings its own interesting sets of challenges, but also certain joys where you get to dive into uh, certain, I think, musical questions that maybe you haven't explored before or haven't had the opportunity to. And I would definitely say that with uh, with the, the theme and with the, the variations that I get to do. It's been a lot of fun sort of putting it in different clothing and um, and actually you can hear it. One of the things that I do in season two is um, I will often start a new theme that we're in season two, for example, the Rondo. And as you get to the end of it, the music itself, start, itself starts to sort of almost like wink back at that theme. So even in the end there over the end credits of episode 10, you can hear that that's that's a like a cello concerto version of the, the rondo that I wrote for season two. But at the end of it, you hear this rhyming with the theme where it's sort of winding around in the cello melody there. So I like to sort of see the ways in which it can exist in the show uh, all, without ever overstaying its welcome because I get very worried about that. I get worried that I'm, you know, you know, I, I never want to overuse it. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you talk about using the cello and the piano, like, were there any instruments that you didn't want to use or that you stayed away, away from? For sure. Um, one of the interesting things that I've found working on Succession is that it is this very complex cocktail of, of gravitas and absurdity. So on the one hand, there's a lot of seriousness because the show is dealing with very serious issues of concentrations of wealth and power. Um, but also there's the absurdity of the day-to-day -day lives of, of this world. And um, I think that ever, you know, ever, you know, going too far towards the, the comedy, I think at times with the music, I never want the music to feel funny. I think one yeah. of the key things is that for me, especially with this show, the f to, to enhance a funny moment, let's say, I think the music should be even more serious. I think funny music doesn't actually sound that funny. So uh, yeah. I found in season two at times that woodwinds uh, felt very, uh, you know, veered into kind of clownishness perhaps. And so mm -hmm. I really avoided woodwinds. Um, and actually brass too, whereas in season one, there was more exploration of a lot of different orchestral colors. Um, I focused in in season two where the strings really felt right to me. And I was very focused with using brass, for example, at that moment of Kendall's departure off the yacht. Uh, you know, so it's very specific reasons for those sounds. Um, and I did a lot of experimenting with that too. It wasn't like I knew that ahead of time. You know, I would sort of <laughs> try out certain scenes and then be like, wow, that, that did not work. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, we'll talk about experimenting with Trent and Atticus. And on that note, let's bring up a clip from Watchmen.
ride home? No thanks. I enjoy walking. Mm. You sure? We just got off duty. How about you come join us for a beer? I appreciate it. But I got an early shift tomorrow. Oh, come on. We're buying. Maybe another time. Okay, then. Another time. Trent Atticus, I mean, that score is incredible. It's, it's incredible. Um, you know, and Nick was talking about experimenting. Talk about how easy or hard it was for you to find the, the tone of Watchmen, especially as this is like your first series. Yeah, I'll, <clears throat> I'll start. Watchmen was a real adventure. You know, we, it's our, it was my first television experience. And um, I think as the medium of television has really gained gravitas and importance in, the, in these times, um, I thought the idea of working on a property like Watchmen with a mind like Damon Lindelof's was something we'd be interested in doing. What we didn't know was what, how, what the story was going to be or how it was going to be told. And when we started on this, um, we had a, a vague outline of what was going to happen and we had the scripts for the first two episodes and that was it so the world building had to kind of be malleable because we didn't know exactly how it was going to end or where it was going to go to get there we knew there's lots of time shifts and uh but we didn't have a clear trajectory. So say if it was a film, we'd know where we're going to end and we'd be conscious all the time of trying to make a cohesive thread that ties those things together thematically, perhaps. With this, it was kind of um, the first uh, question was to get inside Damon's head to see what, what it was he was wanting. And what was also difficult about the script of the first episode was it was hard to read the tone. Like, uh, I didn't know if it was going to play very serious because it's certainly taking on incredibly important and heavy issues. But uh, we were a bit surprised when we saw, we turned over a handful, 90 minutes of music that was improvisational, um, that felt to us like it could be in the world of Watchmen, what we knew of what it was going to be. And of that, about, 10 minutes of that 90 minutes resonated with Damon, but it was enough. They were cutting together the first um, rough cut of the, of the episode. 
And when we saw it, there was a, the role of music became a lot clearer to us. It was much more in the foreground to our, to our surprise. Um, and it added a levity at times where there's bits where it was playful. There was gun battles that was, felt kind of fun instead of deadly serious. And it, it gave us a real roadmap as to what we thought would work in terms of orchestration, instrumentation, and approach, where it would feel pretty modern, pretty uh, analog synthesizer-y, a lot of dissonant drones. Um, and there was a real kind of nudging from Damon and his camp to bring in almost rock band elements, not, not that far from Nine Inch Nails with distorted bass and drums. And it was our first time in a scoring situation to, to utilize that toolkit. Um, that was all great. What, what we found though, is as each episode would come in, there'd be new challenges presented. Like uh, there's a show within a show of American Hero Story, which is the, the campy extreme version of the telling of the old Watchmen tale. But the music for that needs to feel more ridiculous and not like the score. It can help uh, the viewer understand that they're watching a show inside a show. So it gave us a chance to kind of play around with the tropes of superhero films and, and be bombastic and ridiculous, you know, laughing all the time while doing it. And the scene we just saw was probably the culmination of, you know, we're now episode six, we're working chronologically. And as we're realizing the pace of television, oh, it's much quicker than film. You know. Here's the episode and in two weeks we need it, we're gonna be mixing it. And to be hit with the surprise where um, we have a scene that's set in 1940, we need a piece of music that hits all these marks but we'd like it to feel like a big band orchestrated piece with a vocal that can, that could be uh, indistinguishable from the time period and very authentic. But it'd be great if the lyrics could provide a haunting juxtaposition with this terrible lynching scene taking place over it. And could we have it in eight days <laughs> mixed? And so it was a, like I said, it was an adventure. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of things like that thrown at us that it, we hadn't come across before that were challenges that needed to be met. But we were in such a kind of loving environment with a, a real connection with Damon and the filmmaking team that it, it really, there was a chemistry that ignited there. That's that rare thing when working on scoring, you know, that collaboration that when it works and it feels fertile and it feels exciting and motivating and, and that was present throughout this whole process. Yeah. You, you talk about like big band and there's this mix of like jazz, gospel, synths. Um, Atticus, do you want to talk about like some sounds or instruments that you use for the first, like any instruments that you might have used for the first time? Well, we'd certainly never used a big band before, for starters. And earlier in the episode, um, uh, Will is walking through a jazz club and there's a quartet playing and that is a reinvention of a theme that we did with the quartet. Um, but like Trent said, I mean, the span of, of Watchmen, like that, the, the pilot felt, uh, or the first episode felt like we're well within our wheelhouse in terms of, you know, it's exciting to be able to uh, use the kind of toolkit that we might do on a record. But then if you think about episode two, that's the First World War. So it's 1918 and Damon wanted um, kind of, if there, that the, on the one of the records there's a song called how the west was really won and that was kind of the watchman theme i suppose in terms of reoccurring and <clears throat> so episode two opens in 1918 and it's on being played on a kind of out of tune old piano that's we're putting through a gramophone of that era and then as we come into Watchmen present day, 
2019, it morphs into the version of it that you know. So in terms of instruments, we, you know, lot, like Trent said, lots of synthesizers, lots of mm. building new modular, interesting kind of things that, um, well, it would be too boring to go into detail, but there's a certain kind of swarmy sound that we mm -hmm. invented this kind of uh, instrument, I suppose, um, to create that felt very much part of Watchmen. But the most obvious um, answer to your question would be, you know, like what we just watched. You know, yeah. that, that was an entirely new experience for me. And walking into the studio and hearing that played, it was, it was mind blowing. I mean, yeah. just as a, outside of anything else, just as a personal musical experience to go in and see players that good, performing something, you know, that you're a part of, it's, it just feels great. Yeah, yeah. Actual human beings playing real instruments. Maybe there's something to all that. <laughs> <laughs> What did you, this is one for the group then. What did you learn from composing the score for Watchmen and Succession? Like, you know, Nick, this is your second season doing this and Trent, Atticus, this is your first season. Like, was there something you learned from it? Nick, I'll start with you and then work around quickly and then we'll move to like one last audience question. Sure. Um, it's a really good question. I, I would say, I mean, I, I learned a lot of things. Um, I think, you know, um, exploring the length of television and, and thinking about the architecture over such a long period of time uh, is something that I think I'm still learning. Um, you know, uh, thinking about two hours as a structure uh, versus 10 or 20 uh, is, is very different. And I think the psychology too, I mean, thinking about the ways in which things recur um, how they need to change, um, what the experience of a viewer actually is, let's say binge watching 10 episodes, you know, I try to think about that, like what, what is it like if you watch all of this, you know, then it's this long, really long kind of a movie kind of experience. But so I think, you know, I learned a lot about that. Um, and I also think I've learned more about where music can go in certain things. And that's something that I've really learned at working closely with Jesse Armstrong, you know, following his instincts and really, um, understanding, I think, even more the possibilities that certain moments uh, present to us. You know, it, it's not just about, does this piece work musically or beautifully? Really thinking about the second and third degree layers of like, what are we actually trying to say here? Um, and there are certain places I can think of where Jesse would say, you know, actually, I understand this is, the, this is a more beautiful piece, but I think we need maybe a less beautiful piece. We need a more strange or resigned piece to tell a better story here to surprise something. So I think that's something I'm continually uh, trying to learn. What about you, Trent? Well, I'd like to say I'm, I'm, we are both big fans of Succession and the show and your work in Succession. And I had that kind of in mind when I was saying TV, TV, because that mm -hmm. show to me wouldn't be that show without your music. It feels inseparable in, in, a, good, in a good way. Thank you. And I thought, great, we're going to get a theme at the beginning and we're going to, you know, we, we didn't get any of that. <laughs> we didn't, I think I started off thinking it would be in like uh, nine or 10 hour long movies instead of one two hour movie. And in some ways, I think that analysis was right. But in other ways, um, it, it kind of didn't feel that way. You know, I, I felt like, like if I could change one thing about how Watchmen rolled out, it would be, I'd love to have seen what, what exactly is going to happen throughout the whole thing. And, but not having that information because it wasn't written yet. All the later episodes weren't even written yet. And Damon was kind of being cheeky, playing it close, keeping his cards close in terms of plot twists and things that it did kind of feel like we're out here without a net, but that made it exciting because we knew it had to be finished by this short deadline and we had to make decisions. And, you know, Atticus and I, given enough time, we can use that time and we can ask for more time and we can sometimes go past when things are good because we, we can't stop thinking about things. So this was a, I don't know if that was even an answer, but it, it was an interesting and fun experience, and I'm sad that it's, it's only one season for us, but um, it was good. I would, I would do it again. Atticus, what about you? 
Um, well, I learned how to stay up for 72 hours without any drugs. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, I really, without sounding too childish, I do, I do think that music is uh, a constant um, learning process. And in this case, um, combined with the asks, the team that we were working with and, you know, our main communication was with Damon, the level that he's thinking about things, particularly given, you know, like to me, the graphic novel was a vehicle to confront a very, you know, probably the most, the thing, the thing that was threatening us the most. And I think that the TV show, again, is a vehicle to confront a subject matter, which is probably the, the most dire that we're facing. Within that, there's also a TV show that is f fun to watch and exciting and all those other things. But really to be kind of in tune with the way his mind works and the kind of depth that he's thinking about things and how the la this layer connects with that layer within that. And the music really needs to accompany that and be in tune with him. I know some of the viewers might not have seen Succession or Watchmen. So here's a fun audience question. Nick, if somebody hasn't seen Watchmen, what would you say to them to drop everything and be like, this is the show you need to watch? For Watchmen or for Succession? Because I for love Watchmen. It. For Watchmen? Um, well, actually, interestingly, I would say that I think the, well, the music is incredible. I'm a huge fan of the music, for, for, first of all. Um, but I think it's a fascinating blending of many different kinds of genres um, and, and in a way that I actually have never seen done before. Um, and I think the way that all of that is executed in Watchmen uh, is remarkable, actually. Um, so I would just say it, I've never really seen anything quite like it. It is true. That I totally would co-sign on you. And Trent, for people who haven't seen Succession, what would you say to them? Of Like, drop everything, binge the two seasons. Um, I, I kicked in about halfway through season one is when I learned about it and was immediately hooked. And when season two started up, I'm like, every day I'd see him. You, have you watched Succession yet? Nah, I haven't gotten around. Tonight. Watch Succession. I, I found it just compelling, uh, emotionally devastating, um, particularly during you know pre-pandemic, but during these capitalist days we find ourselves in. To I just thought it was done completely excellent. Well, congratulations again to all of you on your Emmy nominations, and sadly we have to wrap up. Um, so thank you, HBO. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, Trent. And thank you. Nicholas.